Kinnerich. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, I'm back with you. So, what is this case about? What is this case not about? And how would you prove the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt? Let's start with this. What's this? Handcuffs. The arm of the state. This is what was on Mr. Holland when the defendant did what he did. Okay. He is in handcuffs. So, let's talk about what the case is about, what it's not about, and how to prove the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Just to go through a couple things that Mr. Britt said during his closing. First, before we do that, I think he mentioned, well, maybe he didn't hear it. Again, he's asking you to look for doubt. He's directing you to the testimony of the nurse. I mean, really, who cares? We've got the photographs and the testimony about what she said and how she viewed him. The statement, that doesn't matter between any difference between her and Mr. Holland. She treated him, and that was the extent of her testimony. And then you'll have the indictment that charged Von Giovanni. He asked you to read it. It has Robert McDonald on it as well. Count one, aggravated assault, charged with Von Giovanni. Apparently, this is some type of grand conspiracy for Mr. Holland on behalf of the state. He talked to you about the plea that was taken by Von Giovanni. I would direct you to page 32 of the transcript. He wanted you to take a look at it. The court tells him, I didn't say you testified for a co-defendant. It didn't say you testified for the state. I don't care if anybody calls you. The only thing I care about is that you take that witness in and you tell the truth. And that's what he was ordered to do. Also, discussion about how he's eligible for first offender because he doesn't have a prior felony conviction, which is a matter of law. Now, let's talk about saw with his hands up, saw up. The video about for Von Giovanni strikes him. He didn't want that video to be played. So who's pulling who about putting the evidence out there? Of course, Your Honor, but she can't. Whether or not a lawyer makes an objection is a matter of law for the court. She can't comment on that to the jury. That's totally improper. Your Honor, I'm in closing argument. He tried to put it out there that he was putting the evidence out there. I believe I'm allowed to respond to that. She's saying about my objection is what she just stated, Judge, and that's totally improper. Just argue the evidence. Now, if you don't, what I'll say about Von Giovanni is this, and we'll talk more about him. If you don't like the plea that he got, write a letter. It doesn't negate what this man did, okay? It doesn't negate it. He is the person who put the gun to Mr. Holland's head, okay? Don't let him skate because of Von Giovanni, I think, which is the first thing I told you when we first started talking. You can watch the videos in court. You can actually request to come in and watch them. I won't play them for you during closing, but that's something that you can do. I don't believe our experts testified, and we'll go through their testimony, that the street is the street. Also, in regards to the radio traffic, and you got the radio traffic, and you've listened to it, with seconds between the step it up on the slide and code four, and you've heard it in court, and then Michelle Harrington talked about how the backup and the other provision on the CAD report was reversed. And then you hear Officer Todd. The backup request is put out. That's why McDonald was headed over there. It's mischaracterizing that he was going over there at that moment with Todd to a 29. That's not the testimony. We actually did ask the victim, when did you get hurt? And the evidence has been that he stated that he got injured after the kick, and the other witnesses have testified that the injuries, nobody saw it until he was basically off the ground. So, again, that's mischaracterizing what has been put for you. Let's talk about what this case is not about. It's not about conjecture. It's not about any rush to judgment. It's not about the victim 
um, being a criminal. It's not about that. Um, it's not about the defendant being the victim. It's not about Bon Giovanni. It's about this man's actions and him throwing his <coughs> money out the window when he did what he did. It's not about giving him a pass um, because being an officer is dangerous. It's not about trying to twist what we see into the video into some kind of way that doesn't get us to where we are. Okay? The video speaks for itself. It's not out about how everybody out there is lying. Again, what does Mr. Diller have to gain by coming to court lying? What does he have to gain? Um, again, it's not about Bon Giovanni. Okay? Very clearly he lied in this case. We charged him, right? Um, but what is this? Bad cop and worse cop. Okay? It's about the actions of McDonald. So what is it about? It's about reasonable doubt and what is reasonable. Um, and I'm going to give you this example. We'll talk about reasonable doubt a little bit before. Growing up in Alabama with my grandmother, um, my grandmother loves sweet cake. Don't take it right in the So in the morning you get up and you go to the cupboard, um, and we lived out in the country, so you know, out in the country led to what I'm about to describe. So you go to the cupboard, you go to get your bag of sugar to make your tea. Okay. You look in there and you see little holes shoot into your bag of sugar. Okay. You see little pellets all around. Now, did you see that rat? No, you didn't. Are you going to drink that tea? No, you're not. Okay? You're not going to drink that tea because you know what happened. Okay? You know a rat's been in there. Okay, so it's about that spilled sugar. It's about that rip bag. Um, it's about the victim and civilians out on the roadway, about how this all was started with a traffic stop. And what I need you to understand from the moment that he kicked him in the head, take that uniform off of him, take that badge away from him. He was acting outside of his employment outside of his training. Okay, no civilian gets to do that. Okay, nobody gets to do that, and he did not get to do that as an officer. He's not acting within the policy or the law. It's about the force and how it's not reasonable. It's about how the, the victim was not actively resisting. It's about how the victim was controlled and in compliance. Again, I will, I will, that's what he said. Now, let's talk more about what it's about. It's about how McDonald threw his training out the window supposed to assess constantly, right? That's what we talked about. Ad nauseum. He was not taught to do this. Nobody taught him to kick somebody in the head. Nobody taught him to put a gun to somebody's head the way he did. He did not dial it back, which is what he was supposed to have done. It's about the conviction. It's not about the convictions, about the victim being a bad guy. Um, it doesn't give them the right to do this to him. And certainly McDonald, these convictions that happen later, McDonald didn't know in 2018 or 19 that he was going to do something wrong. Okay? He didn't have any of that information. Okay? Law enforcement protects all of us, even the bad guys. Okay? Even the bad guys. Law, law enforcement protects all of us. About you call the victim what you want, but again, he's a man in handcuffs. Okay? That's what he is. Call him everything but a child of God, but he's a man in handcuffs on the ground. Got, these are the still photos. You've got them in evidence. Got that little gun circled. Um, let's go back. Look at how uh, Mr. Holland's legs are splayed out. Look at what Bon Giovanni is doing. Holland's legs don't move at all. He's merely looking back at him. You get to kick somebody in the head because they look back at you? That's reasonable? Running up with a gun? Multiple occasions to check it, to stop it, to assess what's going on. He didn't, didn't do any of that. He's grabbing the car door to make sure he gets a good stomp. Okay? Again, we got Mr. Hollins, and then we just had him hit in the face. And again, we got Bon Giovanni standing up. He's not leaning over winded. He's not gasping for breath. He's not doing any of that. And where has there been a fight in any of this? Where's the fight? Where's, what, there is no fight club? That's what the movie was. There is no fight. There was no fight at this moment. We've got the handcuffs circled. Everybody out there saw it except him. And then again, we got Mr. Holmes's body going down, kicked to the head. And then we got the gun coming down. And again, the gun pressed to his head. And that's been the testimony. We got Bon Giovanni holding him down, um, participating. And then we got the gun holstered. So the case comes down to the victim was controlled and compliant. There's no evidence he's acting the fool, none of that. 
Um, there's no active resistance. His legs don't move, move at all. I think I said that before. They're splayed out. It comes down to that video. It comes down to his training. Spent a lot of time talking about his training. Don McQuaid, his name is Mr. Booker. He's still back there. He's not Mr. Brooks, it's Mr. Booker. Mr. Booker don't have law enforcement training. Okay, he's a seven-year-old man. He died because he was scared, okay? But he doesn't have McDonald's training. Officers are trained to go into the firefight, okay? Um, that video, McDonald's training. Call the victim whatever you want in the sign, including calling him a child of God, okay? But let's call him what he was, a man in handcuffs on the ground. Okay, that's what we, okay, so let's take his argument and again introduce all those felony, all those convictions for him to show him that he's a bad guy, right? I mean, that's the purpose of that. Okay, so that's what we're supposed to do as law enforcement. That's what I'm supposed to do as a prosecutor. You know, I run criminal histories in all my victims and I say, good people over here, bad people over there, bad people, I'm not going to care about you. Okay, because you're a bad person. No. No. That's not what law enforcement is supposed to do. That's not what is supposed to happen. Even if he was Sirhan Sirhan, Timmy McVeigh, after he blew up the Oklahoma City bombing, after that, if he's on the ground in handcuffs, you don't get to get your lick in. You don't, okay? Stepping outside the bounds of your training and what's right. Um, now, let's talk about Mr. Holmes. He's been in trouble and you saw him on the stand. You can assess his credibility and who he is, essentially. You think if I had a busload of nuns to call as a witness in this case, I wouldn't have done that? It's not outside the realm of possibility that, guess what, police encounter people who've been in trouble with the law. It doesn't mean you get to kick them in the head. It doesn't mean you get to put a gun to their head. You have to check it. You have to assess. The video of the incident, talked about that. How we get there, and I'll simply say, we don't get there out of the blue. We had to stop, the keys handed over. Um, Dillard starts with the video because he thought, he didn't think anything was going to happen, but then it did. Sees the officer in the car with Hollins. He then comes up with his hands up. Um, he gets the blow from Bon Giovanni. He's tasered, he goes down, he's down in his stomach. And then we get um, Mr. Booker's testimony about the confrontation with the driver. Not really sure what's going on. Saw some tussling, saw that. And then he saw the tasering. And then he saw Mr. Hollins go to the ground. And then we get Ms. Koenig and Mr. Hampton, citizen complaints, okay? What they saw was not cool. They called about excessive force, and that's what they called. The victim was not resisting, is what they said. They were both horrified. Ms. Koenig said she was horrified about what she saw. Her brother's a cop, okay? She didn't like what she saw, so she called 911. She called the police on the police. She saw the strike, okay? I appreciate that Mr. Brett felt sympathy for the strike from Mr. Bon Giovanni, but his client is equally guilty for what he did to Mr. Hollins, okay? And her impression was that the strike had happened on the side of his face. And Mr. Dillard, he's that truck driver, he's making deliveries, he's handcuffed, he, his face is down when he's there, when McDonald gets there, Hollins is on his stomach. Mr. Dillard described him as being controlled, sees the officer hit his radio, standing right on top of him when he gets it. Dillard looks to the right, sees another patrol car coming down. The officer pulls over to the right, sees the officer jogging and running across traffic. He comes with his weapon drawn, ready for action. This is all he testified to. Comes from behind the first officer's cruiser, between the cruiser and the car and right, came in front of the car in front of him. Hollins looks up, the officer then stomps his face. There's no conversation between either of the officers. And we get the aforementioned, oh shit, okay? Let you know, this wasn't reasonable. That's Mr. Dillard's reaction to this, okay? That's what he's seeing, that's what he's saying. Then we see the second officer put the knee on the neck. Again, he said in court, don't fucking move, blow your head off, and that's what he told you. He said that the second officer was looking to inflict, okay? And then he said the knee was on the neck. He sees the gun to the head of Mr. Hollins. He starts feeling because, again, it looks like something's going down. He saw the blood when he goes around in the trunk. Mr. Hot Fallings, his face had bounced off the pavement. Again, told you that he had seen the, the hit upon the cheek, but not in the nose. Again, he's told you that the statements had stuck in his mind after the law enforcement interview. Um, he remembered them. He didn't mention it during the interview, but he does remember the statements. Um, kick, stomp, step in the face was all the same thing to him. 
And again, he didn't see the blood until the other officer. He didn't see the leg sweep. Uh, he felt sorry for Mr. Holmes. We got Mr. Booker picking up his wife at the Walmart. Um, he's in that blue lacrosse. He said the officer put the handcuffs on him. He couldn't see the driver's face. Again, the young man is lying on the street with handcuffs. He sees this too, okay? Everybody sees that Mr. Holmes is in handcuffs except this man. Convenient. Could see the line that goes to the prongs. Out of his peripheral vision, saw another police car, the second officer that ran in front of his car, and then ran between the first car and the police car and saw a pistol in the hand. Now, I'm going back through the evidence because i got to do my job. Okay, I gotta make sure you understand the evidence. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go back to the evidence. It's been a couple of days since you heard these witnesses testify. There was a few feet between the first officer, the first officer's on the radio, the man on the ground turned to look, no conversation between them. The second officer then slows down, he's about to step on his right leg. He ran up to the young man who's looking back. The second officer slowed down. The second officer's feet were not tangled. Um, he said he slowed down and quit running as fast. The second officer then stomped his head. The officer then went down on one knee on back of him, and the gun went down with him, and then both stood up. After the young man was lifted, Booker saw the blood on his face. Hadn't seen it before. He could see the wires coming from the taser. And a Comstock. Again, she's driving that Acura. After she's approaching the lot at Lawrenceville Swanee, she's sitting at the far right-hand lane. She sees a cop car. In the far right hand lane, the lights approaching. She could see it was not going smoothly. She pulls up, the lights turning yellow. She looks over there and she had a vision of what was going on because of the way she pulled her car up. The officer had the gentleman on the ground handcuffed. Again, she sees this. Again, he doesn't, or he says he doesn't. Again, convenient. He was just lying there. He was on his stomach, could see from his torso and up. His face was on the pavement. Saw the first officer speaking on the radio. And that's what she said. The light turned red. Then again, the other officer is running down. The officer slams his foot into the not not placing it. Put somebody down. Um, slammed the foot into the victim's face, and then took the knee up to the chest and slammed it into the side of the victim's face. That's what she testified up to. Caused the victim to move. The kick had not been done in his stride, meaning he runs up and then deliberately does that. Okay, so we're clear on that. Um, second officer kneels, again, set the gun barrel to the side temple of his face. She heard the officer say, don't move or shoot. The children in the car are terrified. Man on the ground hadn't done anything, hadn't tried to hit or kick. Didn't look like he was trying to get up either. There was no conversation between anybody. Uh, the back passenger window was down. Light changes, she drives off. She sees the video, gets in touch with law enforcement. She again could hear what was going on. Now, Mr. Hollins, again, not a choir boy, okay? Um, he admitted things on the stand. McDonald had no idea who he was, okay, or that he would get cases two years down the road for when he ran up and kicked him in the head. He just got off work, stops at the red light, again, go through the traffic stop. Hollins was using his phone. He tried to take, he tried to take video of Von Giovanni because he wanted proof, essentially, is what he said. Um, sitting in the car when the taser gets drawn, Holmes is trying to keep his hands inside and then comes up and gets punched in the face. Gets the taser, rolls on the ground. Again, you saw that, screaming, I will. Puts his hand behind his back. The second officer, McDonald, and comes up to the right side of him. Again, kicks him in the head. While this is happening, the first officer is behind him. He had his head turned around to look. Thought the second officer was going to help him. That's the sad thing about this. He actually thought that McDonald was there to help him. Heroes have arrived, right? No, he gets kicked in the head for his trouble. Officer dropped down, puts his knee on the back of his upper back, puts a gun to his temple, felt the barrel to his head, and the second officer boarding him said, going to shoot, splatter of brains on the street. There's no conversation between anybody, again. And then thought when the gun was to his head, this was the day he was going to die. That's what he said on the stand. Think about the way, remember, manner the way they testify there, and how they appear in front of you. Very clearly, when he was on that stand, his face got emotional. His face went back to that moment in time. And you can look at that when you determine his credibility. I reckon, recognize the second officer laying on the ground, tilted toward the right. He's injured. Uh, he had, what he said on the stand, swelling and bruising. His injuries happened after the kick to the head. And then we get the charges are dismissed. There's charges because the officers were charged. 
Um, he gets a civil attorney. Okay, let's talk about that for a minute. Their training tells them if you screw up, you're subject to civil and criminal liability. Okay? They're trained on that. They know that. Um, let's be real, when government actors step outside their roles, we get lawsuits. Okay? We went to the videotape um, because they hadn't video videotaped it the first time he encountered them. He wanted to be believed, and without a video, he was worried that he would not be believed. And then he, what he actually said was he asked other officers to let them ride with him. Um, this man is the only person saying that the victim asked to ride with him. Z Todd, again, now Snellville, he's working over there at that burglary. He said a burglary call with McDonald. He referred Bon Giovanni, and this is a radio traffic. Um, he had requested additional units, which he indicated with, with his shoulder unit. That's what Todd said. He could hear it. conducting a traffic stop. Todd then tells McDonald to head on. It's not because of the 29 at that moment. It's because a crest is back up on a traffic stop, and that's what the traffic radio says. Um, shortly thereafter, Bon Giovanni puts out that he's in a fight. Todd heads over. He heads and hears the code for himself. When he gets there, the subject's already cuffed, standing up. He's injured. No apparent distress on Bon Giovanni's part. No torn uniform, um, no ripped uniform, no apparent distress. And then Mr. Hans asked him if he could ride with him. That's driving his off. Townley, again, working a second job, heads down there too, hears uh, that there's an altercation on the radio, drives down there, sees Mr. Hans with blood on his face. Neither officer gave any details about what happened. The guy in cuffs is quiet and calm. He's not combative. He's not kicking up sand at this moment. He's quiet and calm. Uh, everybody else is quiet and calm. Suspect asked to ride with him. He said no. Again, told you about the CRT and how they work, how they generally would be in the second. Bon Giovanni and Donald both CRT and how they would work in the same area. Former officer Michael Bon Giovanni indicted, led, not what this case is about, okay? It's about this man's actions and what he did. He talked about doing the traffic stop, um, about Hollins asking for his mom. How dangerous is Mr. Hollins if he's asking for his mommy, okay? Admitted that Hollins' hands were up when he did a forearm strike, admitted tasering him. When Hollins is on the ground, he said he did the code four on the shoulder radio. Shows, says, excuse me, that a downward strike on the rear shoulder, which is interesting because McDonald then says he actually struck him in the face. Said code four before McDonald got there. Says no active resistance. Hollins is controlled. Thinks McDonald had a gun, but didn't know for sure. Um, said that Hollins was grabbing his cell phone. Tries to describe him as freaking out. That's nowhere in the video. Um, denied making false statements. Um, complained about having to say up to write his report, complained about the frozen report, admitted that he only ran the info after the arrest, so he doesn't really know nothing about nothing until he runs them. He admitted he put the taser down, and again, he only got that warrant for misdemeanor instruction, which says offers no violence. He, he swore an oath on that warrant. Um, I'm not saying to you that Bon Giovanni is not lying, okay? Again, we charged him, We're trying to bring you as much of the truth as we can. Okay, in this case. Why would we cut the guy slack after we fought him? That makes no sense. Had to admit that things in his report are not in the video and vice versa. Um, he's lying, but he's not lying about Hollins being in compliance and not actively resisting. Again, when this is going on, he's helping the defendant. That's what the video shows. McDonald gets there, back together. He's there holding him down with the gun to the head. Bon Giovanni took a no low plea. And that's what he said, not contesting that assault because it was the best thing for his family. Okay, that's the old knowledge. No, they're acting together. Bon Giovanni has no oh shit moment, okay? We know they're acting together. You know, Bon Giovanni doesn't go, oh, there's none of that. You know, there's no stop. There's no stop. Please stop. There's none of that, okay? Both are cool with what they're doing, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, then we get the CAD reports and the radio traffic. Radio traffic is in real time. Okay, again, 14, around 14 seconds into it, we get um, that there's a car with no tag. Then we get 216 around that time. We need units to start to 270 Sugarloaf. 225, step it up, step it up. I'm in a 29. 228, dispatch any additional units. And 237, unit 270 puts out a code for everything's okay. Dispatch says slow all response. Three minutes into it, roughly. Unit 270, code four actually got enough officers with me. That's the second code four. Takeaways. Where is this windedness 
okay? He can talk, right? He can say code four. Uh, he's not winded, he's able to talk. And when does a conversation about being winded actually take place? There's really been no clear answer on that. Um, when did they get together and figure that was going to be the story? McDonald never puts himself on scene. Why? Okay, 29 is not all hands on deck, that's a 63. There are two ways to show presence. Um, and if you look at the CAD report, you'll actually see an asterisk next to Bon Giovanni's um, unit number. We get two radios, again, the one in the car and one in the shoulder. And then she talked about when the 10-3 was actually put in about resuming radio traffic. Um, bon Giovanni and McDonald are already there. There's essentially 13 seconds between the five call getting put out and the first code four. That's important because of what McDonald testified to, right? It took about a minute, a little bit of a minute for him to get over there. 13 seconds. No way he didn't hear that. Investigation. We got Nurse Tammy, nurse of the jail. Um, I put Nurse Tammy because everyone said about you that I just did. We see Mr. Holland, saw the tear on the inner lip, saw the bleeding. Um, and then there's no record of physical health or mental health assessment of Holland. She also testified to seeing swelling. We got James Price, um, who talks to both of them afterwards. Again, Bon Giovanni said the guy kept trying to get back in the car. I mentioned the guy had a phone. Again, there's that one in his mom conversation. Then he sees McDonald and says everything is cool. Said, looked him up in jail track, same guy arrested previously. I told Bon Giovanni about the prior arrest. Told him after he found out. Had not recognized him at scene. Mentioned nothing about kicking, stomping, or striking the guy in the head. Sandra Pryor, she, she contacts Bon Giovanni. He calls her a couple hours later. Um, says McDonald, act, McDonald accidentally kicked Perp in the head when he ran up. Um, and asked about whether or not to put in the use of force report. She asked, how do you accidentally kick somebody in the head? Okay, I'm gonna ask you the same question. How do you accidentally kick somebody in the head? Tells him there's a video. McDonald comes into the precinct. She asked what's happened. He said he had a gun in his hand. Didn't know what was going on. Looked like the victim was getting up. She asked him why did he have a gun at He said again, he didn't know what was going on. Doesn't mention anything about the gun or that he kicked the gun. Pryor tells him, to then take a look at the big picture, tells them about that not needing to get tunnel vision, not overacting, that's what she said. She tells both of them to write down what happened. And then what I want you to remember is when I asked Pryor about putting a gun to his head, she said, ooh, let you know how bad that is. Okay, Scarborough, Ford, Blackburn. Investigators now in the DA's office. That video is not altered, okay? That's actually what it was. He slowed down the video so we could get the details. Um, and then Blackburn did a map of where everybody was, so he tried to paint for you the picture about what was going on. Then Assistant Chief Jones, he froze that report because there were concerns about it and didn't want any alterations or changes to it. Larry Williams, he's the investigator. Again, he testified a violation of state law, violates the policy and the oath. He went through the policy and said, the discrepancies between lawful force and what happened here. He walked through his investigation. He, noted, he did note the inconsistencies in Bon Giovanni's report. Um, in court, he noted McDonald grabbing the door, okay, as he's kicking, and then he noted McDonald's statement in his use of force report in court. He talked about seeing bruising in Holmes's lip and swelling. He talked about Bon Giovanni and looking up the reports from 2016. Told you that he took out warrants, but he left the ultimate decision not uncommon to leave it to the DA's office. Which is what we're okay, Training, let's talk about that. Or Dino Bardinelli. What's with everybody having a hard name in this case? I'm just saying. Okay, so we got his training materials entered here. Um, I wanted to make sure you had a clear picture. Man was trained. What did he say? He went, went and counted because of the training, right? He's a good student, right? I don't think there's any evidence he was sitting in the back of the class playing pinochle while this was going on. He had just had use of force training in February 2017, two months before, two months before this man was instructed about use of force being reasonable. Two months. Bardinelli actually taught him DT. Training includes a class and scenario-based drills. McDonald had gone through his FTO training, meaning he had been trained to train other officers. So set aside the idea of him being a rookie. He said he had over 100 arrests. Uh, force should be necessary and reasonable to gain control and compliance. 
Top that force is used when there is active resistance. Cordino talked about low risk traffic stop. Not usually with your gun out, practical considerations. Again, you need, kind of need a free hand if you need to do something. So that's why it's not good to have your gun out. Being able to holster your gun and being able to go hands on. Force is never routine. Okay, the streets are the streets, but you know what? Force is never routine. Okay, it's never routine. And it shouldn't be routine. Okay, no matter who is on the ground in handcuffs, make it Timothy McVeigh, make it anybody, make it Eric Rudolph. Okay, it's never routine. You have to assess what's going on. Force is never routine, but the situation must be constantly assessed for changing circumstances that its application is both necessary and reasonable. We went to the GDM. Lawful force and esprit force and everything that's in there. We went through scenarios, talked about that in handcuffs, not offering violence and resistance, nothing further is required. Even when somebody's kicking up sand, okay, in the back of a squad car, what do they do? Do they go in there and beat the crap out of him? No, they do not. They put leg restraints on him, okay? And I say him, but it can be female too, let's not be gender specific. Um, have to continually reassess. Officers are there for control and compliance. Have to act within what is reasonable and lawful. Um, Cordino, again, the facts have to support the force. Constantly assessing. Control is the goal. Compliance is great if they can get it. He went through the factors that they consider. Nature of the offense. We started off as a traffic offense. How it starts. We got the subject's behavior, what they're doing, the feasibility or availability of other alternative actions, ground position of the officer, if the officer is in danger, injury, exhaustion. Talk about, again, what a seizure is and talk about the training they get on threat assessment. It must be objective to justify a concern. <clears throat> Active resistance, severity of the crime. They go over all of this. And he talked about training on a man with a bat. Again, talk about the little circumstances where you actually put a gun in somebody's head. Hostage situation. You got one chance to take it right, to get it right. You know, the, um, the speed scenario where you got a guy on the, on the bus with the bombs. Okay, you got one chance. This is not what this is. It's not okay to put a gun to the head of somebody who's controlled and complying with no resistance. Forces involved in doing that. Bartonelli talked about uh, confrontational environment, perceived circumstances. Again, the purpose of DT is control. They want to keep it somewhere between not doing anything and beating the crap out of somebody for no reason. Okay? Again, force must be reasonably necessary and lawful. Talk about the option, officer of presence, soft empty hands, hard empty hands which is what the kick would be. But they didn't train on this kick. Nobody trained on this. <coughs> and then Bartonelli talks about force being reactive in nature. Again, you're trying to go a step up. You don't want to be boxing people. You want to do what you got to do and then not do anything further. Okay. But there is nothing in the scenario that required what this man did. At Academy, they go through pressure tests, scenario training. They teach them to constantly evaluate what is going on. Talk about the kicks they teach. The A-frame, the cranial kick, we have to demonstrate that. That is not what McDonald did with this leg up to his chest. Kicks to the head are not taught, they are talked about. If it is your last resort, basically you do what's necessary to do. That is not what this is, okay? Nobody's life was in danger. Talk about compliant versus non-compliant handcuffing. The suspect determines the level of force, but you don't just show up and punch people, okay? You have to be able to turn the switch on and off. Um, again, constantly evaluating, talk about pain compliance. Uh, for somebody who's not compliant with handcuffs, you do that arm maneuver um, to be able to get them to back down so you can actually do what you need to do. But if there's no fight um, and you're back up, you search the suspect, lying there, talk to smack them, you don't do anything. Once the fight stops and control compliance is reached, no more need for anything else. You talked about the conditions black and yellow. Uh, black is when they freeze or they overdo it, and they cover that in the training, so they won't do that. Uh, talk about the show of force, use of force, force policy requires, again, it to be reasonable. Courtney has said that too. Um, nothing about rolling on your back and looking backwards, unless you do, based upon their training, what this man did. Don't fall him down the rabbit hole, okay? Don't go into Wonderland. No accident, okay? He said he knew what he was doing, right? That's what he said. Donald runs up and grabs the car door to balance himself. He couldn't see Hollins' cuffs. That's surprising because he's the only person out there that can't. Um, thought the guy was getting up. Oh, really? You look at him, he looks back at you, and you get to do that to him? That's what you get to do just because he looks back? Um, it's not reasonable or lawful. 
his foot slipped. Um, I think that's the argument that his foot was slipping as he was trying to do that. But again, he's bracing himself at the door, and this is no accident. It's all Bonji's body's fault. It's either from him being there on his lines. But again, this case is about McDonald. You don't get to come to go to court and go, wham! Okay? It's about the actions of this man. Um, all officers said on the stand they were required to take an oath required by law. You can't be policed without it. And policing is dangerous. Well done. Okay? I'm not saying it's not dangerous. What I am saying is you have to assess the situation and act what is reasonable and lawful. Why? Why would this be an accident? Hold the door to get a really good kick in. He's bracing himself. His body bounces off the ground. Why is the gun to his head at all? No matter how long it's there, it should not have been there for a second or at all. This is not a hostage or squat situation. Why does he get to put a gun to somebody's head? Because he had said he had two prior experiences. So everybody gets a gun put to their head? Uh, why did everyone else out there that sees a Hollins is in cuff, but he didn't? Why is he doing anything when there's no active resistance? No problems with control and compliance. He didn't stop to check. Why is this an aggravated assault? Because the victim said, I thought I was going to die with a gun pressed to his head. Um, and the other witnesses described that. Why is he putting what he's putting in his use of force report? Why are they both covering up? Let's be clear, again, Bonji Bonnie's bullet, sees the world as he wants to. Uh, again, we indicted him for that. What is the virginary about what he did? The virginary, you throw a flash bomb to divert somebody. Here, allegedly, he did what he did to make sure the man wouldn't get up. He's not diverting anything. Um, he had watched the video and tried to write the report to confirm it through the video. Why does he describe it as an attempt to push down in a strike? Why is Holland so dangerous that Bon Giovanni put down the taser? Why is Bon Giovanni described as winded by McDonald? Again, you can hear him putting out the code four. Verbal responses, you can hear him. What does a person look like when they're winded? You know, the end of the Peachtree Road Race when you're like, oh, give me a minute, when you can't talk. You know what I mean? He's not winded. He doesn't look like that. And there's the use of force report, and you'll have that in evidence. Okay? Direct your attention to the yellow, which is the bottom part of it. And then the diversionary tactics. He says he's not handcuffed. That's what he said. Um, take away from the report. He never learned, he never took the time to learn the situation. He admits that Bon Giovanni is close to Hollins in his report. He sees Bon Giovanni, sees the taser, sees the taser probe, doesn't see the cuffs, even though everybody else did. Even Booker had his vision blocked. Why are you seeing everything but that? Again, why the heck are you saying winded? It's not winded. Uh, push down or strike. He said he missed the shoulder area. Nothing about his actions appear that he missed anything. Okay? Uh, again, couldn't see cuffs because of his bulky clothing, how he's positioned. Remember Diller talking about there's the cuffs. You just point him out. You can see the cuffs there, they're right there. Uh, what bulky clothing? He wasn't wearing a parka. Okay, there's no evidence of that. Um, no mention of putting the gun to his head. Again, diversionary tactics. There's no, this is not what this is. Okay. Um, the guy is handcuffed. What he put in his report said he was without cuffs. Again, he was trying to match the video to the report. Is everybody lying about everything? Okay. Everybody's lying. Okay. What motivation does anybody have to lie in this case? Um, let's go through what he said on the stand. Let that slide speak for itself just for a moment. Um, clearly prepared for direct cross, I got a little fuzzy. Um, he got fired, he didn't pause, he said there was no conversation between anybody, he didn't feel that was necessary. I was going to run up, use my foot to put his shoulder on the ground and hit him on the side of the cheek. Okay. I don't know why I put my hand on the car door. You have a reason for other physical actions, but not for that. Foot flat, no slipping of the foot, this is not a... My cousin Benny's situation with the differential between the tire wheels. Um, his foot is flat on the on the ground when he does it, trying to quite rolling up as to looking like resistance. I guess everybody who looked at McDonald got a stomp and kick to the head. May have touched the back of his head with a gun. May have touched him, may have not. Said don't move, stop moving when the gun was in his direction. Again, take the uniform off of him from that kick forward. He's not acting as police. Notice his injuries after off the ground, then view the video crying to do in his report. It says didn't know if others were in the car, but then says he knew others were in the car, trying to rely on his perception, but he didn't stop to reassess to check his perception. Uh, when I, in my former life, I was a Fulton County District Attorney, County District Attorney with an ADA there. 
And the case of Katherine Johnson came in. That was when the narcotics officer busted down the door thinking they were getting in a trap house. And they shot and killed a 92-year-old woman. That's a dangerous situation. You got their balls to the wall with everything going in the house. But you get in there, you got to reassess what's happening. The fact that you got a 92-year-old woman in there. You didn't need to reassess it either. Trying to say it's okay to do a press contact in a stop motor situation because of close contact conditions. That makes no sense. This is not a hostage situation. This is not SWAT. This is not a one shot and somebody's going to get killed kind of situation. You knew the guy was in cuffs. He assumed the taser didn't work. There's a lot of assumptions going on. He acknowledged that there were like five other things he could have done besides the foot moment. His hands, his knees, his OC spray, but he had left that um, in his car or took it off. His taser, his aspiton. But wait, you can't hit anybody in the head with that. That's bad. Um, you couldn't have hold, he could have holstered his weapon. Acknowledge his training and that got, just acknowledge his training that got to have more than just your perception or your statement. Had arrested over 100 people. He was taught to assess. Knew what he was doing. That's what he said. Again, this is not an accident. This is not negligence. He saw this, this, and this, but not the cuffs. Though everyone else did. Remembers his finger not on the trigger. Again, that's another detail, but the big one where the guy's in cuffs, you don't remember. Went through radio traffic, the importance of radio traffic listening. He had been listening. Again, he verified there was 13 seconds between step it up and code four. It took him a minute to get there. He had to either heard it on the car radio or his shoulder. If it's not on the report, probably didn't happen. Never taught to kick in the head. This is not ground fighting. What is the virginary? Um, again, the no cuffs. And there is no fight when he gets there. Bon Giovanni is standing up near Hans. Talk briefly. Okay, these are effects. Kick in the head, describing the end of the head, thought he was going to die, describing the injuries, controlled, no active resistance. He did it. Based on the evidence, your inference is he did it. He's not justified. Actions forced, not reasonable. That leads to your direct, your verdict of guilty. However, you did it, but you don't want to hold him accountable. You're not following your oath there. You need to look at the evidence and the law. That would be unreasonable. He did it, but you buy the perception of the defendant. Again, you got to go past what your perception is initially. You have to reassess. That is unreasonable. You have to keep doing what you're doing, which is your training. He's guilty. You're not telling him anything he doesn't already know. The last thing I'm going to leave you with is that at the end of the day, it's about what happened to this man. Injuries and evidence when he was wearing this. You don't get to do this in Gwinnett County. This was not reasonable. You don't get to treat a bad guy like this. I don't care who he is. You can call him a child of God, but he's a man in handcuffs on the ground. You don't get to do this. It violated all his training, the policies, and state law. The victim thought he was going to die with a gun to his head. I'm going to ask that you stand up, not just for Mr. Holmes, but all the citizens. For Gwinnett County, people who saw this, whose day was interrupted by this, and the effect on everybody, I'm going to ask you stand up and speak a word that speaks the truth in this case, which is this defendant is guilty of aggravated assault, violating his oath, and for battery.